So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, today we have uh, Berta Lopez, um, who is currently working at the Spanish Geological Survey. And she's giving a talk on mini basin, salt welds and salt canopy in the Western zone, in the external zone of the Betty Cordillera in Spain. Breakthroughs from seismic reflection, outcrop and gravimetric, gravimetric data. So before introducing Berta, um, I'd like to just mention that um, you can leave uh, questions on the chat or, um, or in the Q&A panel. Um, and we're gonna ask uh, the questions at the end of the talk to Berta directly. Um, so yeah, Berta is a postdoctoral research with more than 10 years of experience in field work, structural geology and salt tectonics. She finished her PhD in geology from the Universidad de Barcelona in 2013. And she focused on salt tectonic evolution of the Cotilla Basin in the Spanish Pyrenees. From 2013 to 20, she held a research position as a field geologist at CASP in Cambridge, United Kingdom, where she accomplished several fieldwork campaigns to very exciting locations, if I may say, such as the Dinarides in Montenegro, the Lusitania Basin in Portugal, the Sverdrup Basin in, Canada, in the Canadian High Arctic, and the Paikoi Range in Arctic Russia. In very recently now, in 2020, she joined the Spanish Geological Survey, EGIGME, as a salt tectonics specialist to study and explore the Betty Cordillera in the Andalusia, which is actually the, top, the topic of our webinar today. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Berta. Um, I'll leave it up to you right now. Okay, I guess you're seeing my screen. Yes. It's still working? It's okay. So. I'm just summarizing my experience on salt tectonics with a few pictures uh, to get started on the talk. So this is a picture of my thesis area in the Spanish Pyrenees where, where I was working and describing salt withdrawal mini basins. And then after my PhD, I was working for seven years at CASP at the UK. And I had the good luck to work in a salt cano canopy in the Canadian Arctic and to be describing halokinetic se sequences in the Lusitanian Basin, amongst others. Then, at the beginning of this year, or at the middle of this year, I joined the Spanish Geological Survey as a salt tectonic specialist. And this is what I'm going to talk today. As you see, the quality of the outcrop is not as spectacular as the Pyrenees. Mainly, you can see olive tree fields. but you will see that you can get out more information that you may think. Also, notice that I've only been working in these projects for, for a few months. Um, so this talk was more, will more be a state of the art and, uh, and a presentation of the most recent views on the salt tectonics scenario for the external zone of the Betics than a presentation of new results. So first of all, big thanks to my co-workers from, from the Geological Institute from Spain for allowing me to present this data. And then let's get started with some terminology. Um, I've got these definitions from the Salt Tectonics Atlas by Martin Jackson and Mike Hudak. So we are all in the same page. So, we understand as an allochthonous salt, as a subhorizontal or moderately dipping salt sheet like salt diapir and placed at the stratigraphic levels above the autochthonous source layer. In the figure below, uh, we can see uh, these geometries in a figure by Mark Rowan depicted in gray. So a salt sheet is an allochthonous salt sourced from one feeder. The extent is greater than its maximum thickness, and it includes salt glaciers, namakir, salt, salt seals, or salt napes. We understand a salt canopy as a composite structure formed through the coalescence of two or more salt sheets. That's the only part of the, of the talk where I'm reading, by the way. It will get more interesting with photographs and maps, but I just want to make sure we all refer to the same structures. And a carapace, I take the definition from the original paper by Hart, uh, is, is considered as a condensed subparallel strata originally deposited over a raised salt dome canopy 
or shift. It would be this tiny red strata in the figure or the orange one in this side. So the drivers for alloctonous salt emplacement, according to the publication by Mark Rowan at the Elsevier book on Permotriassic salt basins, uh, are considered to be, to be three. Uh, first, we can have a long-term decrease in sediment accumulation rate compared to salt rise that will trigger salt expulsion um, from a diaper. Uh, on a second case, we can have uh, an increase on salt rise rate relative to sediment accumulation rate due to a contractional squeezing of a diaper, and this is what has traditionally been considered the main driver for uh, salt sheets. And finally, we can also trigger salt expulsion in the form of a salt sheet by increasing uh, uh, the salt rise rate relative to sedimentation accumulation rate due to the progressive narrowing of a diaper during the formation of an expulsion rollover. So these are the drivers for a loctonous salt emplacement, and we will come back to this later. Finally, I would also like to introduce the schematic salt geometries that, and mini basins that can be associated to salt basins. So in these figures, we see like the base of the canopy depicted in green and several welds depicted in, in yellow. Then salt canopies are typically associated to primary mini basins that are the one located underneath the salt, the one uh, sinking on, uh, subsiding into a loctonous salt, and secondary, and we refer to secondary mini basins when they are subside into autochthonous salt. Mm, then mm, Martin Jackson and Mike Judek defined different, different geometries for this, uh, this secondary mini basins. And finally, another characteristic feature of salt canopies are salt kills, understood as downward projecting mass of salt forming a structural low in the base of an alloctonous salt sheet. This is all the definitions I'm giving today. And let's get introduced into the salt tectonics in the Betic Cordillera. I will present first a couple of slides to, to introduce the regional setting of that area. And then I will subdivide the talk in three areas. Firstly, presenting a cross section by Joan Flinch and Juan Ignacio Soto, who were the first researchers to describe salt structures in the area. Then I will move northwest, northeast, to show the area where I've been working during the last few months. And I will mainly show you a bunch of field photographs of how a salt can canopy in outcrop looks like. And finally, I will present three detailed cross sections that were very recently published by my colleagues in this area of the external betics, where the structure, as we will see, is quite different to, to the previously published works. So from a regional point of view, uh, the betics forms a permotriassic depocenter, uh, like the ones described throughout, throughout Europe. Uh, and it's now inverted and incorporated into an alpine uh, thrust and fault belt. Uh, the geodynamic evolution will be very similar uh, to that described for other Atlantic basins, um, character, characterized, for, it, it would start with a breakup of Pangea at the end of the Hercinian cycle, be followed by salt deposition uh, at the late Triassic. Um, salt deposition, uh, as some of you might notice, in the, in the western border of the Iberian Peninsula was a slightly younger uh, during the Hetantian, that's the early Jurassic, but in the Betics, it's late Triassic in age. So this was followed by a rift event of mid-Jurassic age in our area, but that is a slightly diachronos uh, around in the different um, margins of the Betics, which culminated in the early Cretaceous 
with a hyperextension event related to mantle exhumation. And similarly, this hyperextension event is very well described in the Pyrenees or in the Iberian Newfoundland um, conjugate margins. And it's a slightly diachronous, but occurring mainly during the early Cretaceous. This drifting event was followed by a post drift event uh, during which uh, different stratigraphic units were deposited and, uh, and also experienced salt tectonics. And finally, all the rift basins and related salt structures were reactivated during alpine as a result of alpine tectonics. In the Vetics, this led to the deposition of different stratigraphic units that are summarized in this diagram. Starting with the Kuiper uh, salt level, that it's uh, an evaporitic succession made up at the surface of, of, of versicolor shales uh, with a very characteristic red wine color that we will see later, uh, interlayered with gypsum with some limestones in the Iberian um, uh, in the Iberian sub, in the sub Iberian basin, uh, and um, they contain halite in a depth uh, that is quite strange to find in, in outcrop. Then this is cover, covered by, by pre-rift carbonate platforms, and this is followed by a thick uh, syn rift succession of carbonates, uh, marls, and pelagic and hemipelagic sediments. Finally, the post-rift succession uh, is made up of, of carbonates and siliciclastic rhythmids that are locally referred to as las capas rojas. Uh, we will see pictures of this um, that cover the that sorry that cover the previous salt structures, and the youngest uh, strat um, stratigraphic units are uh, turbiditic sediments that were deposited synchronously to the inversion of the previous basins. So, getting back to the Betics, um, the Betics is a collisional origin or a collisional thrust and fault belt characterized by an easterly directed subduction of oceanic lithosphere uh, that was originated between the South Iberian margin and the Maghrebian Bay and the Maghrebian margin. The orogen is characterized by an internal metamorphic part and an external part made up of Mesozoic cover sediments. These sediments are incorporated into a thin skin uh, fault and thrust belt detached on the upper Triassic level, uh, which is exposed along uh, the Vetics and along the Reef Cordillera. In the talk, I will not get into the orogenic structure of the area, and I will focus on the description of the salt canopy. We will start describing uh, the area with the, the, the salt structure with the previous wor works in the area by Joan Flinch and Juan Ignacio Soto. Uh, the first works were published in the 90s, but they provide a synthesis in a publication in, in, a, in, in a chapter of the book about the Permo-Triassic basins in a, published in Elsevier. So this is their cross, the cross, their cross section. They describe an alloctonous Triassic salt canopy and this, some people had worked previously in the area, but it, this had been described in various manners, including an olestrostromic unit. Uh, this is a reworked Triassic, uh, which, wa uh, which was resedimented during the, during the origin uh, development. So this is now reinterpreted, and this is widely accepted, I think, by all the people working in the area. Uh, that is an alloctonous salt conopy, uh, which is separating some primary mini, mini basins underneath from secondary mini basins above. The evolution of this salt canopy according 
to Joan Flinch and Juan Ignacio Soto is depicted in this diagram. So they consider the salt canopy uh, was, uh, was um, extruded during the late Cretaceous and the Eocene, uh, and it carried some pieces uh, belonging to the carapace. And it was uh, afterwards, uh, it, it, it experienced a second uh, extrusion phase and was remobilized during Oligocene and Miocene times due to shortening related to alpine tectonics. So that's the previous work in the area. And in the next slices, I will show you how this canopy looks like. Um, the photographs belong most of them to this area, and this is the area where I've been working during the last few months. So, so these are this is quite fresh data. I don't have a cross section of the area, but uh, but I think you would be you will be interested in seeing the photographs be, because this is where the canopy is more spectacularly exposed. Let's start with one geological map. That's a one to 50,000 uh, sheet. It's 30 kilometers from side to side and all the pink colors belong to exposed Kuiper salt. This salt in outcrop looks like this um, road cut. It's usually made by very characteristic red wine color shales, uh, interlayered with gypsum at some places anhydrite and interlayered with limestones too. One characteristic uh, feature of the Kuiper fa fascias in, in the Betic Cordillera are these yellow layers that, that correspond to siltstones and very fine grain sandstones that are not as ca characteristic of the Kuiper fascias in other areas. The most characteristic feature is the presence of gypsum and you can find it either like, 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 like this crystalline amalgamate or, with, um, or you can find fragments within the red shales. In other cases, you can see layered gypsum and anhydrite that looks almost in the, its original stratigraphic position, but it's not. And that a bit, a bit further down, it can be show signs of deformation. But the, the typical aspect of the Kuiper level in outcrop is like this. If we zoom out, In, in the Betic Cordillera, the, in, in the area where I've been working this last week, the Kuiper looks like that. I'm just putting this uh, slide to give you a feeling of the scale, because often this is something that we are, that is difficult to imagine. So an olive tree is like three to five meters wide, and all these red colors belong to the, to the Kuiper fascias of this exposed salt canopy. So all this is, is the salt canopy. And the, and the light gray colors are secondary, are myosin sediments deposited on top of the salt canopy. If, if we look to, in a similar area, all these red fields, all is salt covered here by very thin uh, pockets of myosin, myosin sediments. Then moving on, same story with a car a scale. It's huge. I had never seen so much Kuiper together in my in, before. And, okay, now let's zoom in into some areas of this salt canopy. Where the, where the rock consists on a diapir breccia. Well, a diapir related breccia, I interpret it so, as a diapir breccia, but this breccia consists of different class of anhydrite that are incorporated 
into, into, a, into a deposit whose matrix is made of red shale. In other areas, here you, we, we can see different fragments of anhydrite with a matrix made up of red shales and gypsum. And in this case, an anhydrite breccia, breccia with a matrix of also anhydrite and, and this yellowish siltstone. We, have, we don't have a clear interpretation for the origin of this breccia yet, but we are convinced it's related to the diapiric processes as this is accumulated in a mappable unit around the, the myosin mini basins. Apart from this breccia, when the sediments overlaying the canopy are carbonates, and here we move to the primary uh, mini basins. Um, the carbonates show signs of dissolution or an, of an intraformational breccia um, that I interpret as a cap rock. Another image of this breccia, we see all these clots with a carbonate, a carbonate matri matrix, and toward the diapir, it, uh, you start observing red clusters belonging to the Kuiper level. If we get clo a closer look to this, and the only picture I have is of this hand sample, uh, we find here all, all, the, um, all the not soluble parts of the Kuiper that are accumulated in a very thin layer, maybe 20 centi centimeters thin, thin on top of the, of the salt of the diapirs. I'm just showing these pictures because I thought it might be of interest for the people who is mainly working on seismic data and have not seen rocks associated to diapirs, uh, how rocks associated to diapirs look like. So now let's look uh, at another map. Again, pay attention to the, to the size of this. Uh, all the pink colors are the salt, and in this area, it is covered by uh, Cenozoic mini basins. If we get a closer look to these mini basins, uh, first, you've already seen these pictures. You can find it as fine grain, uh, as pockets of fine grain material of a white color in outcrop directly on top of the salt canopy. Or you can find it as a more competent layers sticking out the subdued landscape. All these uh, trees would be on the salt on um, would be growing on the salt canopy. And here we see a informal shape mini basin uh, subsiding into the salt. The border of these mini basins, quite often, it, it, it contains uh, resedimented Kuiper within the, within the turbidites. So this resedimented Kuiper is shown here by these red materials that sometimes contain gypsum fragments. And finally, um, in some cases, you can also observe the border of these diapirs with the mini basin. In this case, we have some overturned turbidates at the mini basin border, but I'm not getting into this detail now. Finally, in some other cases, uh, what we find are channelized, channelized sedimentary body, bodies covering the salt. Here we see a channel, and this would seem all not very special, but a picture from the other side, you can see here the red colors typical, typical of the Kuiper level, and this is sitting directly, directly here. This channel is made up of a, of a quite coarse grained uh, breccia. I mean, some of the clusters are like up to 20 centimeter thick, so it's a high energy current that was directly deposited on top of the Kuiper. 
And the last pictures I will show you belong to this map. Here, it looks exactly the same than the map that I've shown you before, but the sedimentary bodies here are late Cretaceous in age. Having a look at this, I need to, 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 do a, to zoom out into several, into this picture. So you, I can locate yourself in the, in the canopy. So here you see all these red colors belonging to the Kuiper. If you get close to the windmills, um, there are some compet competent layers. And if you get even closer, this, the windmill will be here behind the photograph. These competent layers consist of the stratigraphic unit I referred to as the Capas Rojas. This unit has been interpreted by sedimentologists as a, a hemipelagic unit. Uh, and here it is made by a parallel packages of beds about 20 to 30 meters thick. This unit is what is interpreted uh, as, a, as, a, as a carapace. And in the picture I showed you before, it corresponds to these uh, white slopes here made up of a, of a slightly more competent material than these white, uh, white um, areas here. So having seen pictures of how this canopy looks like, I'm now, I'm gonna present now, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't control the, <laughs> the mouse here. I'm gonna present now three cross sections, in three detailed cross sections in this area that were published by, by my colleagues in this, in this publication. A closer look at the area in this map allows us to see the, the structural style of the area. Uh, there is one, the frontal thrust, thrust carries uh, all these Mesozoic units uh, and, the salt, and the salt level on top of the Guadalquivir Forland Basin. And the, Mesoz the Mesozoic um, basin is separated by a middle thrash sheet. We will refer to this as the lower thrash sheet and the upper thrash sheet. The lower thrash sheet already in the map um, correlates with the, with the canopy I've been showing photographs of. And in this area, this canopy is overlain by Cenozoic sediments in orange, and in some areas by Cretaceous carapaces. Sorry for the pronunciation of this word. The upper thrush sheet uh, invol involves a very different stratigraphic succession, exposes a different stratigraphic succession made up of Jurassic and Mesozoic sedimentary bodies disrupted by late Triassic salt diapirs or by salt diapirs arose from late Triassic salt. Then before getting into details into a cross section of this area, I want to mention the presence of these two transfer faults that cut the, the, the entire structure and are in, in, interpreted as a former transfer zone of the rift system. This transfer fault will control, um, will control changes of the Mesozoic structure and sediments. And I just want you to keep, in, to keep them in mind for later. So let's get into these three cross sections that I've taken from this work. I just, in, in this slide, I just recolored them. I just color them. Um, the structure of the upper thrush sheet consists of a Jurassic to Cretaceous succession that is much thinner than the equivalent succession in the lower thrush sheet. And accordingly, it's folded into, into a series of folds with a much uh, shorter wavelength. 
wavelength. These faults are disrupted uh, in many cases by diapirs that are currently squeezed. The lower thrust sheet consists of a thick uh, succession of Jurassic and Cretaceous sedimentary units that are interpreted as prima primary mini basins and are bounded in many cases by salt wells. The front of the cross sections in the three cases consists of an inflated salt Inflate, inflated salt domain then that towards the west in the pictures I showed you correlates with a salt canopy. Then the, I'm, I'm presenting three cross sections because in, in the first cross section, the salt canopy itself is not exposed apart from the inflated salt domain. Mm, however, the Primary mini you, the primary mini basins are exposed and you can observe them in the geological maps and in outcrops. Then the, the lower two cross sections contain these mini basins that are made up of Cenozoic sediments, but, but of a relatively thick late Cretaceous unit. And these are welded on top of the primary mini, ba mini basins. I think this will clear up with the following slices where I will comment each cross section in detail and I will show you the main constraints used for cross section constructions. So in the first one, we see here all these uh, relatively tight faults of the upper thrust sheet um, affected by diapirs that here is very nicely exposed as a squeezed diapir that thrust over the primary mini basins. And in some cases, you can see tectonic windows of these mini basins. Finally, to the front, details of this inflated, so inflated salt domain with some of the Cenozoic mini basins sinking into it. The, the, the constraints for these cross sections were basically the outcrop data and the seismic line. This seismic uh, was taken in the 70s and the 80s, and it has different degrees of, of resolution. In the, in the frontal part, you can perfectly follow the, the reflectors, but here it becomes more blur. So that's the data we have to work with. Uh, in addition to these seismic lines, there are some well data that give you an idea about the thickness of this uh, underlying um, of this primary mini basin. Apart from the seismic lines, um, most of this structure is exposed. This is a geological map uh, where you can see the upper thrust sheet that is made up of faults generally trending northeast southwest but that at some area, they show this snake-like uh, geometries. And in some other area, they describe symformal depocenters bounded by salt diapirs, which resemble the geometries that you can see in other mini basins. The other feature here is this tectonic window that exposes the lower thrust sheet and that in in outcrop with a Google Earth image would be seen like that. These ridges are made up of Jurassic, all these three ridges, and in the middle of Jurassic limestones. And here in the middle, you have like early and late Cretaceous malts. Um, I first ticked the geological map on top of it. Uh, be careful because this dark purple is the Jurassic, but the light uh, pink is the are outcrops of Triassic rocks that are exposed at the hanging wall of this thrust. Um, on top of, uh, on, in addition to this, this thrust shows silicon lines, uh, really silicon lines indicative of a of a thrust uh, of a northwesterly directed um, thrust direction. Finally, if we move south, you've already seen this map. Uh, there is a huge 
exposed salt body that is referred here as an inflated salt domain. Moving to the, to the other cross section located slightly southwest, um, the structure of the upper thrashed is quite similar. And then I'm showing this cross section to focus on this secondary mini basin welded up on top of the primary mini basin. The constraints for the primary mini basins here are this well, which crosses, crosses almost five kilometers of Jurassic and early Cretaceous sediments, uh, and the seismic lines. Here you can recognize some reflectors. Then here the Kuiper has been interpreted on transparent areas of the seismic lines, and there are some reflectors that climb up this feature that is interpreted as a salt weld. Focusing on these mini basins, this can be uh, observed on the geological maps. Uh, the yellow sediments here belong to these yellow sediments and the green late Cretaceous sediments at the bottom of these secondary mini basins are these light green colors in the map. You have a informal mini basin surrounded by salt. At some points, the sediments are directly, the Miocene sediments are directly overlaying the salt. At some points, they are directly on top late Cretaceous sediments that in the previous slides were interpreted as a salt carapace. So this is the constraint we have. An additional constraint or an additional evidence is the gravimetric response of these sedimentary bodies. Of these sedimentary bodies. Uh, the gravimetric analysis was done to model the response of the lithosphere and to prove that the lithosphere was thickened in this area. However, if we model as well the, gravi the gravimetry uh, of our interpretation, the observed gravimetry is very similar to the calculated gravimetry. I'm just showing this additionally because we have done and I promised it, but look at, look at this well. It, it can, all, the, all the mini basins and, and salt structures we've described in the cross section can be traced through the gravimetric data. And finally, let's have a look to the third cross section. We have the upper thrashed with tight faults. In here, at some points, the Cretaceous is directly overlaying the salt, and this is interpreted as another inflated salt domain. This thrashed thrusts over these primary mini basins that here are, um, and here we have a thick late Cretaceous and Cenozoic mini basin welded on top of this primary mini basin. The, 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 this is interpreted to sink on top of a salt canopy that correlates to the pictures I've, I've shown you before. So. This again is constrained with seismic lines of better resolution here, I've been told, and by wells, by these two wells that cross, again, almost five kilometers of Jurassic and Cretaceous strata. And in map view, this mini basin is, one of these wells is very spectacularly exposed, and I show you how it looks like. This is just a Google Earth view with our field data loaded on top of it. So these wells, you can follow them, them across, the, across the agricultural fields by outcrops, isolated outcrops of, of Kuiper remainders between Miocene that are here in, in orange and Cretaceous that is here in green strata. So in picture, it looks like this. Um, the Kuiper can be perfectly identified 
And then here, the strata of this Miocene basin is steepening up another exposed diapir uh, at this end of the photograph. And on the other side of the well, you have some Cretaceous mulls co cropping out. Again, the gravimetric response uh, of these sedimentary bodies matches well with the uh, observed gravimetric data. And to start closing up, I will show you the sequential restorations of two of these cross-sections. Um, these restorations have been simplified because they are in a, in, a, in, a, in a paper whose main focus is not the salt tectonics, but the, the South Iberian margin evolution. Um, the Jurassic and early Cretaceous pre and some rift sediments is depicted in light gray. The, light, the late Cretaceous post rift, it's in, in this bright um, green, sorry, I confused the color, and the Cenozoic in yellow. The salt, it's in, in pink, as it has been in all, in all the talk. So this has been the shortening of this structure, of this cross-section has been restored in two steps. First, the, the, the lower thrush sheet, this cutoff, has been uh, joined with this one and uh, uh, inter interpreting a diapir. And the upper thrush sheet has been brought southeast, resulting in 145 kilometers of shortening, which is quite significant. Then in this cross section, the salt canopy, those, um, the salt canopy we've been talking about uh, was, not, uh, was not extruded on top of these mini basins. And the structure before shortening looked like that. An area characterized by thick primary mini, ba mini basins, an area characterized by thin primary mini basins, which sunk on top of an inflated salt body. If we go to cross section C, where the thickest secondary mini basin is exposed, uh, the restoration looks like that. Uh, the same, the shortening is restored in two steps. Here you get about 100 kilometers of shortening. And here you see how the structure at the late Cretaceous is interpreted to look like with the upper Crete late Cretaceous mini basin sinking on top of these salt bodies labeled here as a salt canopy. And the two well differentiated sectors in the early Cretaceous uh, paleogeography characterized by two by by an area with thick primary mini basins and an area with thin primary mini basins so we get here to the summary and conclusions of this talk um, I've, I've shown you two main interpretations one by the pioneer works by Juan Flinch and Juan Ignacio Soto and another by by the works published by my colleagues recently the interpretations uh, share some features such as the presence of, of thick primary mini basins beneath um, a salt canopy here that the salt canopy here would relate to this one and the timing of salt, uh, extra, uh, of salt expulsion at the upper Cretaceous afterward, afterwards um, mobilized uh, during Cenozoic shortening. However, uh, relating this cross-section with this cross-section is problematic. Mm. This problem could be related to some minor interpretation issues or could be a major geological problem. That is what we are trying to understand uh, these days. So I, I, uh, that's not the end of the talk yet, but I leave this, these conclusions with an interrogant mark, how to relate this to this. Uh, both cross sections are relatively well constrained with well data, seismic data, and outcrop data. Uh, 
Uh, but the presence of this upper threshold, it's not noticeable at all here. Uh, and, and this uh, canopies, um, this canopy is better developed in this cross section, it seems to be covered here. And finally, to finish, I just want to summarize the, the, um, the elements of the salt canopy that we've seen throughout the talk. So the base of the canopy that is interpreted in this, that is depicted in this figure in green, it can be recognized here at the top of this lower Cretaceous unit and by this oh, and by this salt weld. Here you can follow this base of the canopy too. We have recognized also some kills uh, that are noticeable here and here and obviously mini basin welds for which I've, saw, I've shown some outcrop examples. Uh, Finally, um, we've observed some secondary mini basins that are welded up on top of the primary mini basins. And I want to finish this with this figure from the publication by Mark Rowan to discuss the drivers for the, the, the extrusion of this salt canopy. So uh, considering that this layer that forms the carapace of the canopy and here the base of the secondary mini basins is late Cretaceous in age, which corresponds to the post reef. And that the canopy here, the, so the base of the canopy is early Cretaceous in age of the late early Cretaceous. Uh, I believe that this canopy was firstly extruded um, at the end of the rifting event, possibly due to a decrease in the sedimentation rate. This canopy was afterwards remobilized and possibly the feeders were still open and continued extruding during contraction related to the alpine orogeny. And I think I finish here and I will be happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you so much, Verita. That was wonderful. I'll just, um, if anyone has any questions, if you could please put that in the chat box or the Q&A box right now, and I'll just read through them uh, with Berta. Berta, if you stop sharing your screen, uh, the recording will have just us two interacting back and forth for the view. Sorry, sorry, say again, I was trying. If to... you stop sharing your screen, then it'll be just us I'm, two. I'm trying to find out okay. how all this works. Um... It's okay. Yeah. There you go. Good job. Okay. Okay, so the first question is from Mark Rowan. He says, great talk as always, Berta. You showed both depositional and dissolution breccias. Do you also see any tectonic breccias? And if so, what is their setting? Oh. <laughs> um... Most of the breaches are thing I, I, I've seen are um, these diapir breaches, these anadrite breaches I've seen inside the salt canopy, and the dissolution breach I've, see, I've seen covering the salt canopy. I have no evidence for tectonic breaches, but I can keep you updated if I find any. <laughs> That's great. Okay, here's a comment from Oscar Fernandez. He says, hi, Berta, many thanks for your presentation. I have a question on the water depth of your Cretaceous pelagic units. It looks like your restored cross-section have a pretty flat bathymetry, no major deepening in any direction. Is that so? Or is it a question of scale? For the upper Cretaceous, it should be pretty much like this because it's a very continuous unit across the batics. For the rest of the unit, I, I assume it's a question of, of scale because the Jurassic facies, at least, they show different bathymetric heights in different portions of the subbatics. 
Okay. The next comment is from Nazar. He says, excellent talk with field examples and photos. Great. Uh, another comment from Miguel Morales. He says, excellent presentation. The best field trip I've had ever had in my 30 years of experience. Congratulations. Tim Dooley says, thanks, Berta. Good stuff. Kate Giles says, terrific work, Berta. What is the stratigraphic level that the carbonate cap rock is associated with? Is it dolomite cap rock? And lastly, is there doubly terminated quartz also associated with the diapyric breccia? Sorry, doubly terminated what? Quartz. Quartz. Doubly terminated. I, I'm thinking what does she mean with that? Doubly terminated quartz with the. Sorry. So it would have been quartz that would have grown in situ in the diapyre. Mm. Ah, quartz. Well, and it's okay. often associated okay, with okay. the cap. Sorry. Rock. sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Don't worry. So the I, I'll start with the first part of the question that it's easier. Um, sure. What I've seen this dissolution breccia is on, on Jurassic carbonates. And yes, there were mainly dolomites. Uh, but mainly there is these breccias I've shown, there is this breccia everywhere. When I was working in the Lusitanian basin, it was full of this sort of breccia too. Every time I was next to a diaper, the car and it was flanked or covered by carbonates. These were completely brecciated, and at some point you could see, you could tell it was an intraformational breccia. Mm -hmm. and, it, and in other points, I would have accepted it was a sedimentary breccia. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it wasn't I, necessarily I've been thinking about bre breaches for a, for a little while, and I'm happy okay. to continue emailing about this, about the 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 quartz grown in the in the wells. I've not seen that. Okay, great, thank you. Juan Soto says, "Thank you, Berta. How do you explain the significant differences in thicknesses and facies in the upper thrust sheet?" It seems difficult, these differences, using a single super salt thin basin. So the differences in thickness are well described in, in thickness and in facies are well described in the subbetics traditional stratigraphy as soon as I know, uh, as, as, soon, as, as long as I'm aware of. And I'm just replying this like, thinking on the go, so uh, I, I, I may think about this better and, and reply to him personally later. But I suppose these Jurassic paleogeographic domains were also related to the rift structure, uh, which is not depicted in our restorations, but because the restorations are done in a, in a, at, a, at a larger scale. Maybe if we do more detailed restorations in the future, we have to consider the rift geometry and not just a large salt inflated salt body. Great. David Thomas, Berta, excellent presentation, very well illustrated, learned a lot. Evie Ganaway Dalton, to clarify what the doubly terminated quartz is referred to in the Kepler, I think Kuipler, um, it's in the chat box here, De Cinco de Compostea. Does that ring a bell? Ah, there, Jacinto, no, okay. No, we don't have Jacintos de Compostela in the Betics. I've not seen them. I, okay. I don't say there are not anywhere, but I've not seen them. Cool. Um, David Thomas, could you put your comment in the chat, please, so I can read it? I see that you just raised your hand. Um, Zoltan Unger, he says, thanks and congratulations. Bye. Um, okay. Carlos, congrats, Berta, lovely job. In Petera sections, can you elaborate a bit more about basements, different colors? Thank you, gracias. This might be my fault because I recolored the cross sections. I'm, I'm just over checking now. And I, I can't remember if in the paper, in the original paper, the basement was colored in different, each unit, so the alpha, Puharide, the Malagide, and all the units classically defined in the Vedics. 
I think in the original paper, they are colored in different colors and restored as different units. But I, it's, it's my fault. I just colored it with the same, with the same color because I didn't, want to, I didn't want to enter with the problems with the basement because this is out of my area of expertise. It's okay, no worries. Thank you for explaining. Timothy Grow, do you have good density control for the gravity model? The Jurassic sediments seemed very dense. Can you repeat the question, please? Do you have good density control for your gravity model? The Jurassic sediments seemed very dense. So I guess- I think, is... I, think I have to reply this on the email because the gravity okay. analysis, it's not any of my expertise. Okay. Mark Gordon, uh, he's asking, do you have access to the lithology of the Kepler from deep wells? If so, is the salt lithology more halite rich or is it also gypsum and hydrite like the outcrop? I've not seen the well data, but uh, based on my experience on the Pyrenees and on the presence of, of some springs of, of some salt what salt water springs, I'm convinced there is halite at depth. And, and I, I saw Ignacio Soto corrected me here that there is Jacintos de Compostela in the Betic Kuiper. I've, uh, I, I've, I've not seen them yet, but I'm convinced there are, if he says so. Mm -hmm. Antonio Revigalia, in the restoration, you constructed a piggyback thrust sequence. Do you have constraints for this choice or is it an assumption? Hmm. It's possibly an assumption because in the upper thrust sheet, uh, there are not really syntectonic strata preserved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Clara Rodriguez, one of our panelists, she says, great talk, Berta, I really enjoyed it. You showed us evidence of salt dissolution or what you interpret as cap rock. I'm wondering if the other breccia you showed could be a result of collapse of the overburden since you see a combination of red shale and less soluble evaporites. So a collapse related breccia. It may be, we need, we are investigating this right now. So it's, it's, a, it's a breccia with a mappable extent. This means it extends for 10 kilometers. It's very extensive okay. deposits. So I'm not sure if a collapse uh, breccia can be so extense, but this is something I have to think about during the next years, not even during mm -hmm. the next day. Cool. Okay, we have an, two comments from uh, Guillermo de Mataud. Sorry if I'm butchering the names. Um, it says, he says, Berta, thank you for the presentation. I was lucky enough to work the area near Libraja for a CO2 storage scenario. The 2D data was old and uninterpretable, halite being the ideal facies for storage. You do not mention halite. Is that purely for lack of outcrop evidence, or do you think halite is not present as a salt facies in the area? No, halite is definitely present, but in depth. It's not present in the subsurface, again, as long as I'm aware of. Okay. He also says, uh, excellent talk, Berta. I enjoyed it a lot. In your restoration, you have quantified the approximate volume or thickness of the uh, Kepler mobilized? Yes, the, the, the thickness of Kuiper mobilized in the restoration, it's approximate. Um, even though it's approximate, but in the cross sections, I, I will check quickly the cross sections by, by, by Joan Fleet and, and Juan Ignacio Soto. The Kuiper is penetrated by a well. This is already the allochthonous Triassic 
Kuiper, but this has to come from an autochthonous level. And in these wells, it's like two or three kilometers thick. So it must come from a thick primary level. Great. All right, that's all that we have. Thank you so much. Is there um, anything you would like to add before we close out our webinar for today? No, thanks for okay. listening. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for being here. We're going to have another talk in uh, two weeks, another webinar. And um, I'm just pulling up the schedule right now. So in two weeks, um, we are having Dan, uh, November 17th, Salt Tectonics in Orogenic Settings, Insight from the Romanian Carpathians. Dan Mercia Tomas. So we hope to see you guys then. If you have any questions, uh, you can email uh, the TIG at aapgsaltbasins at gmail.com. We will forward any of your questions or further discussions onto Berta if you don't have her email address. So we can connect you with her if you like. Otherwise, her email address is on all the flyers that we sent out for the, um, the Gmail and also on social media. So thank you all. Thank you, Berta. And uh, we'll see you guys again in two weeks. Thank you, Berta. That was great.